Good evening, uh, and welcome to you all. I'm Mark Mass. I'm the Dean of the School of Theology and Ministry across the way here at Boston College. So I'm delighted you're with us. Uh, before I introduce Jim, I'm supposed to announce that the next speaker in the Lowell uh, series is the Pulitzer Prize winning uh, writer Juno Diaz, who's speaking uh, on February 15th. So hopefully uh, you will join us for that as well. Um, it is an honor for me as well as a pleasure to introduce to you Jim Fisher this evening. Uh, Jim, as you undoubtedly know, is a distinguished professor of the American Religious Experience. Uh, he is a former colleague at Fordham University, and for me, most importantly, he's a friend of mine. Jim is currently the professor of American Studies and Theology in Fordham University, a position into which I quite happily lured him mm -hmm. from a previous position where he was the Dan Forth Professor of Humanities at St. Louis University. Uh, Jim's scholarly output has been extraordinary and has accordingly received high praise from a variety of parts of the academy. His book, The Catholic Counterculture in America, which traced the outsider impulse in American Catholicism from Dorothy Day to the Berrigan Brothers, was called, quote, one of the most important books on U.S. Catholicism of the past decade by David O'Brien. Another book of his, entitled Dr. America, The Lives of Thomas Dewey, was, Dooley, excuse me, The Lives of Thomas Dooley, was acclaimed by political scientists, social historians, and scholars of American religion as a landmark work. And the fact that scholars from that varied group of disciplines should praise him is itself a noteworthy thing. Most recently, his book, entitled On the Irish Waterfront, the, the Crusader, the Movie, and the Soul of New York, which has sold 10,000 copies, is that right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Made uh, Jim into something um, that scholars of American uh, religion rarely achieve, a celebrity. Uh, when it came out in 2010, uh, the current Center for Catholic Studies, of which I was then the director, received multiple phone calls from the Times and ABC News, and most unlikely of all, from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, and I told the center's administrator, Maria Trizzoli, that I could die happy having uh, seen one of our own achieve cult status. <laughs> Most recently, Jim has turned his attention to autism as a social, political, and a religious question. In 2006, Jim sponsored a conference at Fordham University in New York, which was called Autism and Advocacy, the first of its kind anywhere. And it was a real breakthrough. And in a sense, ripples from that event uh, still go on today. And I know that Christina Chu, who is his wife, sponsors a, a, is herself the, uh, um, the director of a, of a blog site that gets thousands of hits on this issue. Uh, this evening, Jim will deliver the annual Candomus lecture entitled A Fallen Away Catholic's Monastic Vocation in Autism Land. Ladies and gentlemen, Jim Fisher. I want to do. Uh, oh, there you go. I always feel like I don't these interviews so much. I always feel like turning the lights down more. But if you can see it, you can see it. You see Charlie here? Yeah. There you go. It's a man. Um, hey, it's so good to be here. I mean, what can I say? You know, I, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Mark Massey because he hired me walking out of the elevator for him, you know, ten years ago. He really did. He said he made good on it. You know, I, I needed to, you know, to be here. Well, there, sorry. <laughs> now, see, don't, I haven't traveled overnight in three years. So it's, it's hard to, I got to remind myself, I'm not in the Port Authority jurisdiction. Like I've been every single day for the last three years. And so um, that's part of the story. It's really, really good to be here. I wouldn't be anywhere without Carlo or Hotel. I mean, forget about here. I wouldn't be anywhere. You know, it just wouldn't you know, exist. You know, because he's meant so much to me. So, I, and I'm really, uh, just tremendously grateful. Thanks so much. Um, thanks for everybody having me. It's just really, really good. And I feel much better. I was, um, I was, uh, I, I was chased after my son uh, like one thirty in the morning last night on uh, a uh, New Jersey roadway, and uh, <laughs> worked out okay. Cool. Had a good day at school today. That was so heartening, you know, because because I, I said to him last night, "Well, this guy said, Charlie, I am going to Boston." Tomorrow. <laughs> it's my, like, you know, you know, and so it all worked out. And um, thanks for every, and thanks to everybody. Thanks for Katie, um, Katie Daly Rucker for doing all this she's done too. And you know, just 
it's just really good to be here. I used to do this for a living, and now and maybe I can do, come back in three more years. <laughs> it's great. So this is this new project we're doing, and um, it's 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 a little it's a little there's some difficult material in here tonight, um, and then there's this real hopeful stuff too, mostly about Charlie. You know, for the past for the past two years, my son Charlie and I, he'll turn 15 in May. We've shared over 10,000 riding miles together on our matching mountain bikes. Um, you know, that's the only activity request in my entire lifetime I've never once turned down. Um, Charlie comes home and he says, bike ride, yes. And um, regardless of the weather, oh, excuse me, temperature. This image here we have is from uh, a year ago. We had a big blizzard in New Jersey, 37 inches of snow the day after Christmas. I don't know if you got a little bit of that up here. And, uh, and so we said, well, we can't ride bikes, Charlie. And then I said, wait a second, how about the Jersey Shore? I said to my wife, the Jersey Shore, it never snows. <laughs> it never gets snow down there, but because of the salt air. But they did actually, they moved, removed it. So this is an image from, I guess, like late December of last year. And um, we pretty much ride bike. And now this year, we haven't missed a day for weather. You know, we've been, it's a 12 month a year thing. We're grateful for that global warming phenomenon. Um, because this is something that's the most important thing we do. In fact, but going back to the time we started in 2003, we've actually, in terms of miles, we've circumnavigated the globe, which is like 22 or 3,000 something miles. Um, but 10,000 miles, just in the past two years, that's nearly the equivalent miles of pedaling from our home in Union County, New Jersey, to say the eastern edge of Mongolia, followed by a return trip for a visit with Charlie's beloved Gong Gong and Paw Paw, his maternal grandparents who live in Oakland, California. The actual mileage, though, is entirely accrued across parts of four counties in north central New Jersey and a barrier island off the South Jersey coast. Um, and one unforgettable foray across the George Washington Bridge uh, for a high speed up the west side ride amid unyielding and unforgiving New York City style weekend warriors. That's pretty good for any kid. Um, but for what a judge severely autistic, it might make for one of the better father son. Travelogues, this side of, well, say, Mongolia, where, where a few years ago a professional horse trainer named Rupert Isaacson took his son, his autistic son, for a journey to um, uh, engage an encounter with um, shamans and gurus uh, for a transformative encounter with local shamans and healers. The horse boy uh, is but one work among dozens in what I call the autism conversion narrative genre. I wrote an essay several years ago called No Search, No Subject, which I treated. And it was great to go into somebody, to, to step out of my own field. I've never been like a phrase maker in any of my own fields, but I walked across this line to like this totally unfamiliar field, and I wrote this essay about the autism conversion narrative genre, and all of a sudden, oh cool, autism conversion narrative, you know what I mean? It's like I took my religious history thing you would never get anywhere talking, because it's so ubiquitous in American religious history, but people in the autism circles that that is great because it's true. The, the, the field of autism literature, the market of autism literature for about 20 years, 80s and 90s in particular, it was dominated by conversion narratives which basically claimed uh, miraculous or unmiraculous cures of autism for a long time. And that was really a dominant genre of literature in the field. Um, since the time that the diagnostic label itself, autism, that is, was misleadingly coined by failed poets as the memoirist and autism mother Clara Claiborne Park dubbed the psychoanalytic community's leading lights in the post-war <laughs> era. These self-anointed healers promised to liberate a submerged autonomous selfhood from the prison of autism. That is, they claimed to the ability to heal uh, through psychoanalysis to, to cure people from autism, which did not, it could not materialize as cures, to say the least. Once the psycho psychoanalytic theories uh, were found and discredited as to autism's causation, a whole new genre of healing literature emerged from parents, of significant cohort of parents, who, uh, that emerged in the 1980s and 1990s. But by 2006, when the novelist and autism mother, Tammy McGovern, wrote in the New York Times, I've never met a recovered child outside the pages of these old books. Um, mm. More credible accounts were beginning to emerge, even Gotta play with this again. Even in a book like The Horse Boy, which kind of, which is in the which is in the conversion narrative genre, but interestingly enough, and revealing the conversion, of course, the conversion is, is affected in the life of the father, not the autistic mm -hmm. son, who remains autistic by the father's own account. Uh, and that's a significant that's a significant change in um, a very significant change. And that what's really gone on in recent years is that people with autistic family members, loved ones, 
have been focusing more on changing their own perspective because you're not going to because because being autistic is like having blue eyes, you know, and so it doesn't you know, change. Mm. Although, as I talked to Carlo earlier, you might, you might have heard, for those of you some interest, there's this whole big diagnostic brouhaha of the so-called DSM-5, which is the big you know, psychiatric manual. A lot of folks who have been diagnosed with autism are being sort of decommissioned because they're considered to have a too mild a version. Yes. Uh, and so that's, you know, that's an interesting issue we don't treat tonight because my son is the classic original <laughs> of autism. And so we heal, there is no diagnostic change in categories that will ever affect him. Um, so, and I'm, okay, I'm saying that uh, um, more credible accounts begin to emerge, even when, like the horse boy, they deploy spectacular locations and exotic supporting characters. The horse boy remains autistic. The conversion is affected in Rupert Isaacson's way of seeing. My representations of Charlie Fisher this evening treat not a conversion, not a, either of us, but about a collaboration, sans shamans. Charlie's a young man of precious few words, mostly nouns. I'm a man of far too many. <laughs> lately, lately, this phenomenon or this practice called echolalia has been his preferred mode of speech. Echolalia is, is simply when someone repeats back pretty much precisely what they, the last speaker who's spoken to them has mm -hmm. recited. In Charlie's case, it's amazing because you, talk, you say something to him and you hear this beautifully mellifluous, highly, t the very enhanced tonalities of your own speech. And it's like, yeah, it's pretty good. He needs my spokesman for any time because he's got a beautiful voice and he just doesn't volunteer much of his own speech. So um, what, what, I, what I was able to devise in terms of our communication on the bikes, by singing a line, say, of a song lyric, then repeating it again, minus the final words or phrases, Charlie then hits the call and response stride by completing the line as his own. So for example, um, remember the great Broadway musical, Damn Yankees? We got each other, right? Charlie does the each other, and I got the we, we got, so I feed him the beginning of the line, he completes it, and effectively that's our dialogue, you know, that's, and that's all we do on the bikes. There's no monologues for me, 10,000 miles worth of silence, we call it monastic vocation. And I know people know me will find it impossible to believe, but it's true, <laughs> and really it's true. All we do is these chanting kind of numbers, no spontaneous monologues for me, um, but it's so, and there's so much more. It, it's been a fantastic experience, it's been a great experience in my life. I say to Charlie, Charlie, I can hear your smiles. He's got a way of smiling that is so expansive, you know, and it's so, it's so joyous. You get behind, I'm behind him, and I say, Charlie, I can hear you smiling, which is really a beautiful thing. And um, so um, that's all great. And, I, and these spin moves, I don't have a picture of this. I call it the Earl of Pearl Monroe spin move. He does this thing where he gets off his bike, he dismounts his bicycle at a given point in the road, and he very, very gracefully simply does a pirouette, like a really an amazingly graceful spin move. And then just very deliberately climbs back on his bicycle and off he goes. And um, those are just the things, you know, I say, um, you rarely see anything as graceful. Um, it's absolutely beautiful by any world's aesthetic standards. That author, Clara Claiborne Park, she likened her autistic daughter, Jessie's wrenching inevitable collision with a non-autistic world to quote, Exiting Nirvana, which is the title of a very, very good, among the better autism memoirs, Exiting Nirvana. I picture Charlie Fisher surrounded by a mountain of stacky cups at 18 months old. Perfect form and order, no trial and error needed. He stacks them all perfectly by shape, size, and color on the first go around. In other words, he's surrounded with a big bunch of, you know, yellow, green, whatever, all these things. And he, he can immediately, you know, he can pick, he will pick out exactly the one that goes on top of the one that he's stacked. And it's, not, it's astonishing, really, because it's like, oh, so why do you do that? You know, must have seen Rain Man or something. You know, like, you know, in other words, he has some of these skills that people took, but this is not the, that significant because it's a great thing to be able to do. And when I remember when people, one uh, couple saw Charlie, they said, wow, he's really going to be gifted and talented. And, you know, of course, if you could stack stacking cups for 18 hours a day for the rest of your life, you'd have a, Charlie would be your guy. But I mean, think the world doesn't work that way, the world in which we ask people like Charlie to engage sort of the rest of us you know, communally. So um, um, he too then was inevitably dragged from that and other nirvanas. Though he continually reconstructs a moral and aesthetic order in his most familiar <coughs> settings. This is one thing I should sort of, the other thing that's very fascinating, it could also be a little bit maddening about Charlie. Charlie has this extremely fastidious liturgical. <laughs> Uh, aesthetic, spiritual, moral order of um, the platonic ideal of the way things ought to be. 
one of the, one of the touches is this is paw paw, this internal pair of sneakers, and this, the lace is like he will take as long as he needs to be absolutely certain that those laces are laid out in front of the sneakers precisely as they need to be. So even if it looks like it's any kind of slight random quality, every it's amazing because if you just lot, he will immediately recognize it, even if it's not there. I noticed that you can tell. He thinks you're tampering. So he's got this, and this is something that a lot of people would find to be very characteristic of autism, is that kind of obsession with order and sameness. And it has a certain kind of ritual quality. So um, I suggested here, you know, that this astoundingly fastidious cultivation of a ritual order revokes ancient, ancient origins of religious practice. It hints at what latecomers, ideas like natural law, child development theories, really are human evolution. This has a certain very kind of ancient kind of quality to it. I mean, in other words, it makes you think about the origins of religious devotions in a kind of a pre-doctrinal way. He per performs daily this kind of pre-doctrinal devotional practice. Grad uh, very gradually, fascinatingly, he gradually uh, recycles or substitutes new materials for old. A shifting array of objects, daddy's blue jacket, pawpaw shoes, arranged precisely in places mm -hmm. like the living room floor, the back seat of the car. Mm -hmm. Their presence represents a highly fixable still point amid the sensory chaos that he otherwise encounters. Because for Charlie, and I think for so many people with autism, it, it's been understood in all so many different ways. I think the sensory chaos is really the main way of understanding the autism experience, at least in this case. Uh, because when you have that sensory chaos and sort of dysfunction, there's a desire to be able to fix on something that's not going to move and dis dis disorient you even further. And so it, people with autism often create their own kind of aesthetic and moral universe as a means of fixing a point that, on which they can, which, which will remain reliable. For them. Um, and it's not simply a protest of the demands of others, but against an entire sensory environment of war as own mechanisms for peaceful moral order. Sometimes, too, sadly, the intensity of devotion turns against itself, like Louis Jordan in Timpany Five. You should have seen what he did with the Louis Jordan DVD or CD after listening to it every single day for about, I don't know, eight months. Um, he decided he no longer was a Louis Jordan fan. <laughs> and so I mean, it got a little active. Um, sometimes the intensity of his devotion turns against itself. And this is really baffling. And this is one of the really heartbreaking things about Charlie's own condition. Many people with autism don't suffer from this particular issue of self-injury. He was two years old. He'd just about been diagnosed. We were living in St. Paul, Minnesota. We were in some kind of office depot. We were kind of reeling, of course, from the news of his diagnosis. He was diagnosed early because he was very diagnosable at that age. But we were leaving this office supply store and like with the concrete floor and fluorescent lights. And those fluorescent lights, you know, they look very differently, I think, to people with autism that they do to many of us. And he suddenly dropped to his knees and smacked his forehead on the ground, on the floor, concrete floor as hard as he could. And um, that was very disconcerting. Uh, there are daunting, frightening issues of self-injurious violence in our corner of autism land. Sensory overland, some overload, sometimes too much joy, too much of a love thing, as though he's trying to loose its demanding grip. Devotion becomes debilitating work. All the world takes on a different shape. Um, and of course, as his caregiver, uh, or supervisor, sponsor, Christine and I, we find ourselves developing sort of uh, new modes of vigilance for a shifting array of objects. In, in recent months, it's been Mercury, uh, Mercury Grand Marquis of Butterscotch Hue, of which they're all too many. They're far too many, because there are two in our neighborhood alone, which we had significant challenges trying to keep Charlie separated from those objects. And then we were riding our bicycles up in the countryside, up near where Dave is from, up in Morris County, New Jersey, and I saw a Butterscotch Grand Marquis for sale. And as we drove past, I made a note to myself, I gotta buy that car and just get it out of circulation because we're gonna have serious trouble with Charlie jumping off his bike. Well, luckily, by then that had passed, so we, so we managed to get through that. But that's kind of what, that's one of the really, really unusual dimensions of this life in autism land is suddenly you know, a child or adult may develop this obsession or fixation for a certain kind of object. And it's not only objects, sometimes it's been the sound or tone of voices, ours or that of a schoolmate. Uh, which I learned very slowly and have adapted to virtual silence. We live in a virtually, I say monastic. We, my wife and I tend to text messages across the living room <laughs> to each other. Uh, the sound of music is always, Charlie always has his own <coughs> music. Um, then sometimes when dad leaves town for the first time in three years, as witnessed last night, um, that collaboration uh, uh, 
it's very emotional in the exchanges with a nonverbal child. Better to happen last night, though, than tonight when Christina's alone with Charlie. His suffering is heartbreakingly real, as is his joy. His extreme joy and extreme suffering is at least how I, and of course I'm not Charlie, I'm not speaking for him. Uh, I'm speaking for myself, my own experience of knowing him and loving him for about nearly 15 years. If history is what hurts, as the critic Frederick Jameson contends, few histories hurt more than that of this human condition. Though it's almost entirely unwritten, there is a very good book, by the way, after a long series of books that were not really very impressive. There's a wonderful book by a fine young scholar named Chloe Silverman, teaches at Penn State. It's called Understanding Autism. It's a really tremendous book. I recommend it. It's interested in a very good history. And it also treats a lot of contemporary issues, too. Um, treatments of autism tend to isolate the phenomena in a manner that apes the conventional view of autism itself that is as isolated as a condition of social withdrawal and isolation. In doing so, ignoring um, uh, links to the past, to other forms of cognitive difference, to culture and religion and politics. That's something I'm going to do tonight. It's a long introduction, but I'm going to do something tonight, talking not about Charlie and autism until a little bit later. I'm going to talk about my own experience of cognitive difference in a moral order that was imposed from the outside, not the one that I imposed, but that was imposed on me, which are standards I failed to meet in the judgment of an <laughs> important adult in my life. And um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn to Charlie and offer an account of my own experience of cognitive difference. His neurological condition and mine, very largely genetic, but they're practiced in a kind of thick emotional context. As history, there's limits yet what I can say about Charlie's unfolding story. He's 14 years old. I don't see him quite yet as a historical figure. I got my own historical story to share about my own experience of cognitive difference in the context of the moral order of all moral orders. And amazingly, there is no written history on this. There is no written example of the kind of narrative I'm going to propose to present to you right now. So we'll start with our own. The version of Roman Catholicism, which I was raised in the 60s and 70s, featured tenacious of slipping hold to a claim as the moral order of moral orders. And it goes back centuries, but certainly in the U.S. from the 1920s well into the 1960s, this is the ubiquitous motif of Catholic thought. And it, I'm leaving out, I'm not going to, so when I get into the, Mark Masson does these things very pithily. I always do these things very kind of awkwardly, these theoretical, kind of, these sort of moral theological things. But the basic premise, there's always a very central premise, is that the achievement of social justice, this is Catholic social thought, the achievement of social justice uh, was an achievement Oh, oh, the achievement of social justice proceeds from a foundation in moral and social order. I'll give me an example. For the great progressive Catholic social thinker John A. Ryan, Monsignor John A. Ryan, who wrote this thing called The Reconstruction of the Social Order, which is a plan for reconstructing American society after World War I. Um, a living wage, which was not enjoyed by that many workers, a living wage promoted family life in harmony with natural law, which natural law is the foundation of all Catholic social teaching. Why? Because if you can feed more children, you don't have to resort to the use of birth control or artificial contraception. So this is a very, this is really the inter, this is, and Mark has written about why, the example I just gave is a very good example in his own work, why Catholic social thought doesn't fit neatly to categories of liberal versus conservative, because there's this, there's a focus on moral order and natural law, which, is a whole separate way of approaching these kinds of social issues. The 1940s, the Christian moral order um, was modeled in a family ideal, too. Um, very likely, in many cases, certainly as in my father's family, the moral dimension was wholly dominant over the social question. That's, you know, that, that I know about his family, and I think it's true for most American Catholic families by the 1940s, when uh, the idea of achieving a kind of Christian moral order uh, was less controversial than some of the issues that were raised by the social question. And of course, they're all inculcated in things like the Baltimore Catechism's formulas. More than redoubled at home, my grandmother Gladys was born in Brooklyn in 1903. Shortly after her father drowned while digging the Panama Canal, that her mother, my great-grandmother Mary Keeley, was left with uh, to, uh, three, show, three daughters, a single mom, raised her family in bitter poverty in Brooklyn. Uh, Gladys married my grandfather James A. Fisher in the 1920s. They struggled mightily through the Depression years of the 1930s, moving constantly. My father used to always say, we lost the house, which means they were dispossessed. They moved constantly from Brooklyn, which was to, to uh, Bergen County, New Jersey, where they finally settled. My father had a younger sister who died uh, in early childhood. He could not be allowed to die. Um, my grandmother's 
tendency toward overscrupulosity, blended with elements of my father's own temperament, meant that by the age of 10, his mother could count on him to supervise his younger siblings while she bust across the Hudson to meet my grandfather for happy hour cocktails in Manhattan. Uh, my, my father uh, imposed moral order on his very, very fractious and very active younger brother and his sister. Uh, and he, she, she, he, assumed this very, he assumed this very adult responsibility at a young age, and it was never clear how he felt about it because he wasn't talking. <laughs> I can put it that way to you. Um, my, it, it, amazingly enough, my, the family fortunes dramatically improved. There was an interesting demographic things related to World War II. My father was too young for World War II. My grandfather was too old. My grandfather went from basically being a glorified office boy or copy boy, office boy in the garment industry to a management position. Amazing. Great country. During the war, the family being descended a couple of notches in the social hierarchy, and he could send his two sons to the Jesuit High School of St. Peter's Prep in Jersey City, and then to the University of Notre Dame, where at both places, the necessity for these young men to bring the Christian moral order to fruition was rigorously evangelized. Mm-hmm. It's also the case that my father's four years at Notre Dame, the Fighting Irish were undefeated. <laughs> which meant that the football team was confirming the physical order, the Catholic physical order at the same time. And then, fascinatingly, my father's final semester at Notre Dame, he took a course on Christian marriage with Father Theodore M. Hesper of the Holy Cross Fathers, then the longtime president of Notre Dame. And what was interesting about this course was, it was considered a very progressive, it was almost a daring and progressive notion to teach a theology of marriage. To talk about theology to lay people, particularly theology of marriage, which is going to treat issues at least of legally sexuality and family and those kinds of things, which focused, though, on the notion of male headship, what many people would say now would call patriarchy, and um, a, ri- a rigorously moral order in the family mirroring the hierarchical nature of the church itself. In 1953, one of the anomalous, richly anomalous parents, my father married Gracie, my late mom, as she was known all her life. Uh, she was also known as Miss Shakes long before she ever took a drink. She suffered from nervous disorders. Uh, she was a mad talker, like her one son. Uh, my father began a slow ascent in management uh, corporate uh, system. Uh, and then my sister Kathy was born in 1954, two years before. I came along, and then another sister six years later, both delight delights to my father in different ways. There was a terrible flood in the Naugatuck Valley in Connecticut in October 1955. Uh, my mother was expecting me in five more months. Uh, this was cited initially as the culprit for the differences readily apparent in me from birth. Um, my mother apparently floated out of this rental home in Stanford into the street when the tributary broke in the neighborhood. Um, my beloved maternal grandmother, Noni Honan, uh, called me a drowned chicken on our first view of me after birth. Um, I howled to the heavens all through the christening. The priest declared me a future bishop. But here was the real difference. Here was the real difference. From earliest childhood, from earliest childhood, voices heard through a wall or from the front of a bus while I rode in the back claimed and demanded as much of my attention as that of my seatmate next to me. That made for one unruly, scrawny kid. Um, I sense what I was supposed to do. But the effort of feigning appropriate concentration could fake it, but never make it. A response, a beat, my response was always a beat fast or a beat slow, or I was always engaged in some kind of overlapping dialogue, like living in a Robert Altman movie, who of course is my favorite, now, the great Catholic filmmaker Robert Altman. And many of my students will say, well, let's try to watch a Robert Altman film, because this must be a hoax. I say, hoax. This is art, you know, with a imitating life. Um, Charlie's, Charlie, my son Charlie's sensory responses are off by entire measures or pages of the score. My infinitely less challenging expression of what our friend Phil Schwartz, who's here in Boston, calls the broader phenotype. That is, there's an autism category, there's a, there's a classic autism category, and then there's what he calls the broader phenotype, which 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 refers to um, I'm not use, I don't need the microphone to that was a good thing. The broader phenotype refers to all conditions this cognitive difference, disability, dysfunction, whatever you want to call it, which are related in some way or other to the autism spectrum, or on the autism spectrum. And I was part of the broader phenotype. Um, the most challenging feature of the way God made me was that um, the off switch was and is really the default mode of my brain. Before I stopped answering the phone, which nobody does anymore, so I don't have to worry about it, I was perpetually assuring callers, no, you've not awakened me. I couldn't very well say to them, it's my brain. I'm not asleep. I'm not asleep. And I got into this habit, I did this for a long time. When the phone would ring, I knew somebody, because I would get so 
dormant mentally alone, when the phone would ring, I would do a little practice. I'd say, hello, you know what I mean? So I could sound like I was peppy and alert, you know? Because I, I was tired, people said, I'm sorry I woke you. Um, it, just, it can't just be turned on. The brain got to be revved up to keep it going. And then, the tricky part, it's damn near impossible to stop it. By one account, such brain is like a Ferrari engine with no brakes. And of course, there's a, there's a tradition of revving by shortcuts that are not always the most wholesome. Although, I was almost famous in high school as the freak who is that way just naturally, as opposed to um, influence of substances. In fact, I mean, that would change, but in 18 years under my father's roof, I violated an area civil statute that I recall. I was, however, a fast-talking, smart-ass, walking, one-boy menace to Christian world order that was, that, whose outlines were never fully articulated. Uh, I, I've never used this term perfect storm in my life. I'm using it now. This is a perfect storm. It never really lifted. Uh, my being, as much as my behavior, represented a violation of the moral order of my father. He never yielded an inch in his Catholic moral authority. We think it's easier for so-called neurotypicals than autistics and others on the spectrum to adjust to circumstances by adapting their worldview. Not so. And let's remember, we're talking about someone who was formed in this era. This is a deeply authoritarian tradition with even totalitarian features accessible to the most ardent. It's easy to forget that dispensation, that militant Catholic era. My father's Catholicism was as immovable as autism in its resistance to change or external threat. He was hardwired for all practical purposes, and the key function of his hardwiring was to practice vigilance of disorderly eruptions of all kinds. Thanks to the great scholar Robert Orsi, we know that the foundation of this Christian moral order, the church's proprietary claim over the bodies of Catholic children, intensified in the 1930s and grew even stronger over time. As Orsi explained in his book Between Heaven and Earth, quote, Children's bodies generally, their comportment, not only in the spaces of the sacred, but also in the streets and alleys around the churches, were the subject of persistent concern among Catholic educators and commentators in the years just before and after the Second World War. In 1941, the leading journal for U.S. clerics, Catholic clerics, the Ecclesiastical Review, published a disturbing fantasy by a Philadelphia priest, quote, a lurid and graphic tale of another priest stopping an altar boy to death for failing to, quote, properly memorize the Latin prayers, possibly an early indication of the rough Catholic handling of cognitive difference. In May of 1964, a newly re relocated in Cheshire, Connecticut, uh, received First Holy Communion in St. Bridget's Church. Some relatives drove up, a few highballs were served. My father actually laid down on the grass beside me in our backyard for the first and only time in his life. And he asked me, about the collectively disorderly behavior of my fellow communicants. Not singling me out, perhaps again for the last time. These transgressions had entirely evaded my notice. So much to discern, so few words. This case, even among, in this case, even among Catholics, higher standards would be expected from me. Failed dismally. Not from lack of childish effort, 18 months prior to the First Communion, while still living in Pittsburgh, Sister Mary Isabella at St. Simon and Jude School, at the height of really, or the beginnings of the, of the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, promised us that while we would all likely be dead in a couple of days, we could count on achieving eternal salvation the more we prepared and free of sin. For more direct action during the Missile Crisis, I sat on a milk box at our, outside of our rental home with a Mattel machine gun. This was action against them incoming Cuban Russian <laughs> missiles. Earlier in the Cold War, my father grew enamored in this traditionally low-key manner by the Blessed Virgin Mary's Blue Army, spiritual commandos uh, in the final crusade against godless communism. I bought an, art, an artifact tonight. Had he been a real soldier, this is very significant, had my father been a real soldier, our lives might have been very different. So many men in his generation, particularly Amer American Catholics who grew up in this insular subculture, they had a much more broader vision of things from serving, say, overseas with others. Instead, my father, you know, he wasn't a fanatic, but he was, he was never a fanatic about anything, but he was um, enamored of this, uh, this blue army. And this is the book called Russia Will Be Converted. It's an amazing oh, artifact. It has yeah, this um, yeah. crucifix with a hammer and sickle. Jesus Christ crucified on a hammer and sickle. And um, my, this is an autograph copy from 1954 from the author John Hathaway, my father's an author. And, and in our home, Growing up, we only had a handful, a relative handful of books, and the rest of them had names like 
What Not to Name the Baby. This book totally fascinated me. And the one thing that fascinated, fascinated me about this book, when you're a kid, when you're interested in the whole moral, moral uh, issues, the incredibly stark depiction of good and evil evil. Uh, this is the communist mayor of the town near Fatima who basically devoted himself to squashing uh, news of the Blessed Virgin Mary's apparition in Fatima. Now, to Carlo. Carlo's going to have slide over soon. This is obviously a film still. You can't do this. I mean, I, I see, I see, I see enough film. Yeah, I see enough film, film stills. But this is, a, this is a remarkable image of uh, evil, of communist evil. Not, and not Soviet communist evil, but a kind of a, um, a, kind of a, a, a spreading Version, you know, that uh, was bent on taking over all of West Christendom. Um, I was determined to rid the world of that scourge. This is Arturo Santos. I was very emotional about it as a very young child. Only to discover within a couple of years, my own bizarre comportment rendered me the enemy within. You know, I became the domestic version of this Portuguese mayor who would have squashed the Marian apparition of the Fatima. And I know how manipulative this is now, but here I am, the menace to society that I was at the age of 10. And, um, no, this is this um, Despite my affinity for my parents' outlook, here's the thing, every cognitive exchange, and this is what those whole condition, even though I'm functioning relatively well now, every cognitive exchange in certain settings was freighted with dissonance and spiritual judgment. Mm. But just one example, the man with the green fingernails at Shea Stadium. When Shea Stadium first opened, it was this kind of showcase. My grandparents treated my father and I to a ball game in the Mets and the Cincinnati Reds around 1963. And uh, there was a man across the aisle from us, and he had green fingernails, and he, had, he was visited very, very regularly by the beer tender. It was amazing. They used the metal openers in those days. The whole process was fascinating. The sound of the beer being poured. This was think about my own future, you know, sort of taking that in. But then I heard the man say to the beer tender, what's the record for the most beers consumed? He didn't say consumed. He said, what's the record for most beers drunk here at Shea? And the beer tender, of course, is humor. And I turned to my father and said, hey, Dad, I said, what's the record for the most beers drunk here at Shea Stadium? And he said, watch the game, son. And he looked straight ahead and never looked to the side. As he did. And I always looked to the side. And so we had this major kind of cognitive conflict there. Um, there, there were as many conflicts as there were sensory transactions. As both a child and an adult, I knew and heard things I shouldn't have because voices of the distance competed for and often won my attention while conversations near at hand went unattended. These atypical neurological features made of me what I call a criminal of perception, taken from Neil Doctorow's term for an obsessively history-haunted character from his powerful 1971 novel, The Book of Daniel. Coming in off the compulsory beat, like a criminal perception, changed everything forever. Not only at home, it hindered my social development generally and led to an unbroken skein of check marks at school for deficiency and self-control. I never evaded a check mark in any marking period for self-control deficiencies. <laughs> um, in early childhood, I was already accident prone, and I was prone to accidentally experiencing things like, what would it look like if a peanut butter jar fell from the table to the floor? In those days, they were glass, it flattened. Can you imagine a glass peanut butter jar flattening itself on the floor? Um, this is a very early memory. I was four years old. My father smacked me on the side of the head. It felt analogously flattened on one side. I kept talking. He kept swinging. This went on until I was nearly 18 years old, at which time I finally, finally it dawned on me. I f at least feigned to lift my arm in a gesture of self-defense. And there was a look in his eyes of terror mingled with this much more primal look, which suggested to me, I could have killed you a million times. Um, the world blows up in these experiences of my own. There's a new hole in the world each time this happens. I have a very strong conviction that my son Charlie's experience with his own more self-generated struggles uh, operates similarly. That is, what happens with my son when he's self-injurious, when he comes out of it, he has this look and says, what happened? What hit me? What happened? What happened? He hit himself. Um, my father's Catholicism, I want to stress, was entirely eminently of the most mainstream variety. We're not talking any kind of Mel Gibson antics here, Mel Gibson's father. <laughs> my father was on the altar every weekend of my entire life at home. He lectured, commentator. He has highlighted the year he got his feet washed on Holy Thursday. Is it Holy Thursday or Holy Saturday? He gets feet washed. He uh, performed as much interaction with the clergy as possible. When he retired, or was retired from his job after 40 years, he was described by his much younger boss as Jim Fisher, the ultimate company man. Uh, which was a tremendous accomplishment. He was also the ultimate company Catholic. And um, in, in contrast, 
I was doing something objectively wrong in those years. Someday we'll have a book, I don't know if there's any moral theologians here, but someday we're going to have a body of literature and moral theology on these issues of cognitive difference and ethics in the family, church, etc. Because somewhere, I fully acknowledge these kinds of cognitive differences can harden into forms of character defects. Responsibility must be taken, even as I sketch the context in which these emerge. Now, a kid like me, you're looking for a little breathing room. So I turned to my mother's side. And my mom's side, by contrast, were ordinary Catholics. That meant they attended only Catholic schools for their entire careers. They never missed a Sunday Mass or Holy Day of Obligation. They were regular novenas stations for the cross. There was no out marriage. They lived in the same town as my mother, uh, excuse me, as my, as my father's family. Um, the only muted dissent I ever heard within the two families is that my, my maternal grandfather occasionally referred to my father as the crown prince. <laughs> and so my, mother, my mother's side was never viewed as adequately Catholic by my father. So that was my, my mother's sister is my godmother. My late uncle Eddie was not adequately Catholic to serve as my godfather. So my father recruited a guy he'd known in Notre Dame who, appeared, who later appeared on the cover of Life magazine in his full regalia of Member of the Knights of Columbus. That was in 1957. By then, it was long since I'd heard from this guy, even though I'd been born a year earlier, and he'd never been heard or seen since. So my father sometimes misjudged these things. Um, but he, my father had this unbelievably high standard of Catholic probity. Um, my mother uh, also presented mixed messages as a result of her mental illnesses. Uh, my father sometimes would say, I couldn't keep quiet. My father would say, you're ruining another dinner. And my mother would say, oh, let him talk. That's how the Kennedys got so smart. <laughs> <laughs> Kennedy's elected president, we're all going to move to Australia. It's remarkable because we had relatives, dis dissolute Irish relatives who fled to Australia. It was hard to imagine joining them. Um, my mother also had a very real and raw and poignant spirituality. Um, she would go to confession, we all went to confession every Saturday. My mother was the only person in confession. Her North Jersey accent is in Connecticut. Her North Jersey, you, you could hear every word, I have to say, the entire church added to the street. And the thing that was so poignant and touching about it is that my mother wasn't doing the perfunctory, I lied seven times. She was really doing a kind of form of pastoral counseling with a priest who himself had suffered from depression. They spent, and she spent a lot of time in that. very touching. My mother's role was to articulate and narrate everything uh, and name it. And does the, she did the denominational credentialing. Um, she was the one that first referred to a, friend, a mother of a friend as a fallen away Catholic. And the way she expressed it, I didn't even need definition in that. This is a woman who was destined for eternal damnation. And it was the most power, one of the most powerful religious images and memories of my, of my life. Um, decades later, on the news of the diagnosis of my son Charlie, she said, that's okay, he goes right to heaven. To which I said, well, he's got that going for himself. Um, but he hoped he'll live 80 or 90 years here on Earth, too. Um, she was very contradictory. Sometimes she ratted me out on business trips. Uh, and that is, on my father's return from business trips. And I get it in the head before he even put his briefcase down running from the car. Um, Gracie had worked before her marriage in advertising the mutual broadcasting network, WOR, 1440 Broadway, in Manhattan. Her highlight of her she worked for the great Jack Bailey on the Queen for a Day radio show for a while TV. Uh, and she always was fascinated with the media, and it, it totally made me who I became. She used to get the New York Herald Tribune delivered by mail two days late, and she loved talk radio, and she was only allowed to listen to it during business hours, but my father wouldn't tolerate it. But there was a guy called Bill Mazur, the amazing Mazur. He was the first, really the first, at WABC Radio, he was the first sports call in talk show host in New York in the mid-1960s. And my mother loved to tout him to me as a Buffalo Catholic. In fact, he was a Russian war in Brooklyn Jew, whose cover was finally blown while he was bantering with a young caller from the boroughs over the divided baseball loyalties between father and son. Mazur said, uh, what do you think of your father, a Yankee fan? And the kid said, I think he's nuts. And I remember that moment. Like, the kid said, wow, what a, what a remarkable way, a loving, <laughs> bantering way for father and son to talk about his father. My parents, on hearing it, both spontaneously said, that is the most disrespectful thing we have ever heard. The amazing major was no longer a Buffalo Catholic. They fretted endlessly over these porous boundaries, which, which were like a magnet to me. And especially between those fateful, fateful years, 1967 and 69, the moment those political and religious boundaries were crumbling most 
dramatically. And here, this is a signal moment. I'm sorry, this, this is a little disturbing to me, but not the image, but the story that goes with all the memories like it was yesterday. What about this YouTube, how it's changed? You know, we can take our memories right to the source. No, I've never forgotten this moment. This is March of 1967. Why will the sports a late Saturday afternoon? Howard Cosell was famed to broker a bout between Wilton Stilt Chamberlain and Muhammad Ali, who was only 10 weeks from uh, refusing to uh, be inducted into the military in April that year. They're calling me up to dinner, I yelling, wait, this is the greatest thing ever. This is, and it's, I did have a weakness, a gullibility for these kinds of related to, to Daniel Borsable pseudo events. I just thought this, I had this thing about this kind of spectacular, dramatic pseudo events, like Will Shake, the prospect of Will Shake going to the ring with Muhammad Ali. And so uh, I was tardy for dinner. Mayhem met me at the top of the stairs and into the kitchen. My father perceived me as if to show me what Wilt the Stilt might do to Muhammad Ali if Ali was required to fight with his hands strictly at his sides. He plastered me all over the walls, cabinets, the kitchen, that little split level house in 96 Blue Ridge Circle. It was like he had six arms all at once, wildly flailing, largely ineffectual blows. Carlo, of course. Years later, I went to the box sale in Mexico City with my friend Jeff Rosen, and by the third knockout I'd missed, I was looking for you know, I mean, I had nothing, but I was looking for these big, ridiculous, cinematic haymaker. And my friend Jeff said, Jim, the shortest distance between two points, a short line. And the guy, you know, another being, it's not a fact, you, you waste a lot of energy with these looping, open handed blows. But they didn't feel that good at the same time. Here, um, um, so, uh, and then in this case, what's a little bit dis disturbing, he then grabbed his keys without the door. And of course, typically in almost every situation, I'm still capable of asking you a question, where'd he go? My mother said, he's gone. And this time, he's not coming back. And it's your fault. Well, he came back a half hour later. Um, I've talked to friends from that era, Catholic friends. Many of them actually received much better and more explicit explanations that having been beaten by their parents, they were the one who committed the sin because um, their parents had been forced to reinforce the Christian moral order that they violated. Uh, I had a friend named Bobby Borselman, father was driving his home from Lily practice, and I couldn't believe the nerve of this kid. He was we were Robert Alden, we weren't allowed nobody's allowed to see the, the Catholic in Cheshire, Connecticut was allowed to go see the movie version of MASH. And so Bobby Borsel insisted on pressing, and the father said, No, you're not gonna go see it. And then father said, Come on, why not? And his father said, Why not? Because there's fornication right on the screen. That's why. <laughs> and I forgot that. Because, of course, I know what fornication was, but I knew it was something serious. And I knew it was, but also I knew it was a good, straightforward explanation, which I never really received. I was supposed to simply intuit all these things, which you do. There was a lot of, I mean, we're getting close to the end of the Catholic violence, blow by blow here. But there was a worse mayhem, uh, it usually seemed to occur linked to religious practice, rituals, and holidays. Christmas Eve massacre. Uh, it was a blinding blizzard in 67 or 68. My father said, get out there and start shoveling. It was like midnight. I was really kind of hopped up on the idea of hanging in you know, a warm house and stuff. I was getting a little older. And uh, I said, look, I'll do it all at once in the morning. I got up early before church. And my father had this thing about removal. It was a very strong theme, my father, removal of things, sort of, immediately. Uh, Sunday, they called it the most segregated hour in America. It was Sunday, 11 a.m. It was the most dangerous in our house. My father had this thing about trying to shave my head with an electric razor when I came home. And mind you, I was an altar boy for four of these years. In good standing. Uh, if for all that appeared from the church, we seemed to be a kind of a fine Catholic family. It all became very, very political during this time. And of course, it politicized me, which is pretty cool for an 11-year-old. You know, it, made me, it certainly gave me, it gave me an enormous change in my outlook, which has which has been permanent in many ways. Uh, we finally made, a, our family made a final attempt at a family vacation to Jersey Shore for a week in August of 1969. It happened to coincide with a horrible murder spree of crazed hippie freaks in Southern California. My father generally spoke, not in complete sentences, but in innuendos. He had very, very effective use of innuendos. Um, this was uh, an innuendo that uh, pers pers possessed more clarity than I'd ever heard him express before. He essentially indicated that um, I was Charles Manson's secret East Coast cell leader, and the evidence of my reaching puberty meant that the gravest dual threat ever to Western civilization was underway. Um, and that does conclude the blow by blow Catholic violence portion of our program. Um, because at the same time, these desperate straits, straits I felt myself in inspired a kind of precocity under pressure. My parents once cornered me and they said, Don't you understand about the path to hell that you're on? And I heard myself saying, not consciously. <laughs> where did I come up with that? Like, where did I learn that word? You know, there was a certain way in which like, I felt I was actually in a kind of somewhat of a life-threatening situation at times. And I found myself 
First of all, I found myself learning how to read more intently. It wasn't that easy because um, all this kind of sensory dysfunction, it, was a lot of, it, it takes a lot of effort to burn away all the distractions. But reading, of course, was the way in which I began to um, find that world outside. Um, and I became the world's most ardent Mahatma fan, of course, during those years of his exile from the title. I was taught to think, this is where it gets interesting, I was taught to think during those same three years by lay teachers at a Catholic junior high school, St. Bridget's Junior High School in Cheshire, Connecticut. I loved it. I loved Catholic school. I loved every minute of it. It wasn't Catholic school I had a problem with. It was Catholic home that troubled me. And then they moved to, they read by, again, another move from my father's job. They ended up in North Jersey public schools where I reveled in history and English classes. I failed at everything else, more so. Uh, I rather I was morose, lonely, manic, antisocial demeanor. And um, the equipment in the chemistry labs always had a habit of blowing up when I entered the room, spontaneously combusting. I was dragged in from the halls for a very different treatment that I'd known in home or Catholic school. I was tested rigorously, and I was diagnosed in 1973 with a condition called minimal brain damage, which uh, had something to do with attention, concentration, and focus. But, come on, minimal brain damage. That was tailor-made for guerrilla theater in the corridors. The kids were saying, yeah, sure, you fell another algebra test, another chemistry test. Hey, baby, I got minimal brain damage. And I wouldn't expect, and you give me a break on that. Um, then they added, though, the school psychologist added this very, very loaded issue. They said, we're also going to tell your parents that you get absolutely no emotional support for that. I indicated to the school psychologist that might not be the best idea <laughs> to me. Uh, and indeed, you know, this generated my father, really, the final innuendo. I think I remember him citing the sinister conspiracies arrayed against him. In retrospect, of course, you know, how vulnerable was he? Uh, unprepared in so many ways for the modern world. He was a corporate management type. He lived in suburban America, and in many respects, he was simply wholly unprepared by virtue of his formation for the world in which he found himself. Now, I have no illusion, of course, about what Robert Coles called this, the closed totalitarian nature of psychotherapy in the 1950s and 60s. And so it's not like I'm suggesting, well, if I my father been a psychotherapist, no, not at all. But that, in fact, it certainly offered a kind of a different perspective than we, I was accustomed to. And I've, I was sort of fascinated by this different way of examining these kinds of issues. Now, suddenly, I want to point out, too, amid all of this, came the most haunting glimpse of what might have been. My all-time hero, Roberto Clemente, died delivering relief supplies to victims of a Nicaragua earthquake on New Year's Eve, 1972. My father, without really even asking, he told me he was going to take me to the memorial of St. Patrick's Cathedral in Manhattan uh, in honor of Roberto Clemente. We drove to the city in total silence, as always. Every year, it was a great treat. He took me to a Pittsburgh Pirate Camp at Shea Stadium, and we never exchanged words. Now, of course, I was this man talker, but there was one person I'd never conversed with in my life. Total silence. But in this case, this was the total silence of genuine grieving. I was lucky enough at the time, at 16, Clemente was the person closest to me who had ever died. I, of course, never met him. He was my hero, and I had this very intimate kind of relationship with him in that way. Turns out he wasn't even Catholic. Fascinating. I only learned this year. I couldn't care less what he was. I, I assume my father probably assumed he was Catholic. But it meant that, um, but, but the point I make is my father um, showed no concern. He showed no concern for the issue that, uh, of Clemente's religion, nor did he show any concern for the fact the entire St. Patrick's Cathedral was filled with the bodies of Hispanic people, with two exceptions besides my father and I. Bowie Kuhn, the baseball commissioner, and John D. Lindsay, the mayor of New York City, which meant Undoubtedly, for the first time in the long history of St. Patrick's Cathedral, there were only two Irish people in the, in the house, which has to be some kind of historical record. My father, had, my father had no misgivings. My father had no, he had no reservations. He had no, why, he didn't have any innuendo. Uh, it was the first time our shared silence was rich in meaning. He let me in on a grieving, a tradition of Irish grieving, like a father might do. And I was, you know, I never forgot that. In 1994, essay I indicated the source of my historical vocation. An essay for an anthology conceived by Tom Ferraro, a friend of mine, and Carlos, and others, helped establish the field of U.S. Catholic studies. The study of history I wrote in this essay called "Clearing the Streets of the Catholic Lost Generation." The study of history appealed to me as a means for connecting the riots in our house with the riots in the streets of places like Newark where my great aunts cooled their heels in fear and anger behind barricaded apartment doors. Mm -hmm. That is, I found this to be a remarkably meaningful way of connecting what was a terrible sort of private experience with a broader kind of public disorder at the time. I discovered this vocation. I practiced the closest equivalent, I discovered the closest equivalent of that communal ethos 
in which the broader Catholic tradition gloried that I'd never experienced. A community of scholars in U.S. Catholic history. When I met David O'Brien as a graduate student in 1981, I told him I had no parish. He replied, that makes you and plenty others. Um, they became my parish, this community. Not so far removed where I was coming from. There were plausible connections to my own family. O'Brien was a Notre Dame graduate. This whole phenomenon was confirmed in an all-night session at a faculty club uh, in South Bend in 1982. And I went on to meet such wonderful scholars, Jim O'Toole, Mark Massey here, and then later figures like Carlo and some of the others who directly or indirectly work in this area of ethnic, cultural, urban studies. I was very argumentative, but I could never make an argument. That was part of my environment. But these figures sustained me anyway. By then, those years I was embarked on a simultaneous 15-year experiment in moral disorder that bore precious little fruit. But by the mid-1990s, early 1990s, I was changing my manner of living. I met my wife, Christina. We got married. We moved to the Midwest where I taught Catholic studies at Urban Jesuit University. Around that time, a Time Magazine cover story appeared on uh, this condition called now called attention deficit hyperactive disorder. My mother sent me the story. She said, Jimmy, you got all the symptoms. Um, so too did she. So Gracie did it even more, I'm afraid. But I certainly submitted to an official ADHD diagnosis. The psychiatrist said, there won't be any support groups for you. I said, why not? He said, oh, those are for people who were looking for an identity they don't really have. He said, you are the original. And so, um, and then not long thereafter, my son Charlie was born, uh, spent days in the ICU. Uh, beginning a process that led early to his diagnosis of autism, and then began a long journey in autism land. A steady stream of speech behavior therapists kept him with us against long odds. He was really destined for institutionalization at an early age, and this daily witness ever since. I never had it practiced or followed any discipline regimen all my life. Now, for 13 years, I've relentlessly shown up for life, uh, despite at times being mentally beset by the challenges. Um, now, I'd like to just talk for a couple minutes, just a minute, about um, the project of which this is going to be part, the origins of this book project, because I found myself seeing everything in light of our life with Charlie, including our relationships or my relationships with others across three generations. I was always fascinated by um, the social critic Philip Brief. He made an observation in 1966 in a book called The Triumph of the Therapeutic. He said, as cultures change, so do the modal types that are their bearers. And I'd always be fascinated by that line, and it kind of dawned on me as I reflected on myself and my father and my son, what rich material there was here. My father, essentially in the, grounded in the late medieval, early modern Catholicism, to me, disorderly, beaten at Catholic, modernist, tinged with cognitive differences, to the kind of postmodern neurological age represented by my son, because we did live in a neurological age, or I like to call it a neuro age, because, you know, Hey, those of you who teach in college, you know, there's an unprecedented number of students with learning disabilities, cognitive dif differences and disabilities. These are not uh, culturally constructed. They are neurologically constructed, and of course they're expressed in relationships. And so we're living in what I call the neuro age, and so what, remarkably in three generations, to go from this basically medieval Catholic model of my father to the experience of my son. So, that's the historical vocation of me that wants to get out again and do this project. But there's also this very emotional dimension on the personal front, too. Uh, when I see Charlie in the ocean, which I don't do anymore because last Easter he tried to swim to Europe and we had to get him. Well, he didn't have to get fished out because he got himself out, but it was a little bit scary because the water's 49 degrees. But when I see Charlie in the ocean over the years, I often think about um, or, or have a more of a kind of emotional experience of becoming like a father to myself. Because it evoked the joy that was denied my own father when I was frolicking in the ocean at Charlie's age, who didn't really you know, enjoy, seem to enjoy that. Charlie, of course, has this remarkable physical grace to redeem my own clumsiness. Uh, also, this um, element, a very significant issue of fear that links me and my father and Charlie. My father was beset by fears of the loss of eternal salvation. Mine, of course, was the loss of Charlie himself before we can secure a communal setting. Uh, you know, that I never found, certainly in my, you know, my religious, organized religious experience, or any experience, I've uh, been, um, been beset with doubts for years about Charlie's fate, uh, this deep emotion, desire for spirituality, linking us, finally bonds us all together. As I understand, the monastic silence of autism land was in fact achieved in reflection on the failings in my past. That is, I'm not saying that I could have learned to be quiet in my father's presence, but because I did it, I had a chance to reflect back on that, and in fact, show to myself and to Charlie that it was possible for someone like me to change, to change my own mode of being 
in, re in response to actual circumstances. Finally, I even had my own grow up and get over yourself. Some of you might be wondering, anybody time somebody talking, oh, woe is me, my child, grow up and get over yourself, which I did in collaboration with my beloved mother-in-law, okay, was two uh, under really very difficult situation with Charlie. Uh, I really decided, I, in fact, had fully embraced this vocation. My poor mom, basically, well, she had poor mom, it's not fair because her self-advocacy was a big dilemma, but my mother had this one of her many phrases, she said, I can't take another minute of it. And, um, <laughs> I, I remember like always having it in the back of my mind, and we, in one of those difficult situations Charlie ever endured, I realized I can definitely take another minute of it. I can take unlimited minutes of it if I have to, if it will, as it works out for him. Um, and so, um, all this is about the embracing of a vocation. And um, all these emotional issues link us all three generations of ways once inconceivable, because there was no, I described the, I, I talked about the emotional famine and my own family of origin, but in fact there are emotions there are, whether they're expressed or not. The ultimate challenge, then, remains, in this project I'm trying to do, an offering and literary representation of my own father. You know, there's been a lot of stuff about Irish fathers in recent years. American Magazine, in a review of Joe Queen's book, Closing Time, about his drunken Irish father, said, boy, it's been a really bad time for Irish fathers in literary, literary parlance. My father, though, he wasn't a drunken lout. Um, he wasn't a drunk. He wasn't a volatile, starry-eyed dreamer or displaced Irish chieftain. He was known to be kind to the people who worked for him. He often said his own lack of ruthlessness is all that held him back in corporate life. And I didn't doubt it. His mantra was, don't get excited. <laughs> um, so very different. He was so very different, though, in my presence and in the presence of those who were close to me. When I was in college, I lived for a semester with an Irish-American kid from a large South Boston family whose father recently won the lottery. Uh, I mean, I think it was the actually legitimate state lock sanctioned game by then, chance. Uh, and there's his father that treated as many kids to an immediate, if generally short lived, college experiences. And my friend Stephen spoke, matter of factly, before he met my father, the brawls he had with his own old man. So when my father came to visit under somewhat troubled circumstances for me, I figured Steve would reassuringly classify him by type I could work with. He instead later said, your father is the scariest man I've ever seen. Your only hope is to get away immediately as far as possible. Um, I talk about environmental triggers of autism, chemicals or some such trigger. I triggered something in this chemical company executive. I didn't get as far away as I could. That was probably revealing. I stayed nearby enough, and we both tried, really, for the rest of the least as long as my father continues to live. Um, now, I wanna, I'm, gonna, I'm getting near the end. I wanted to say, um, I'm going to very briefly, this family history course, it predisposed me, to, uh, frankly, to overreact, I think, to reports uh, coming out on sex abuse, especially in the last 10 years. Um, I have a feel, I, I'm not going to say very much at all. I think that the survivors of sexual abuse, from what I understand, that generally they were more religious than I was, they were more generally Catholic, and probably better people. Um, but I also want to say the religion I grew up with did suffer from this grievous fatal flaw in a kind of a culture-wide formation process with a kind of inverted notion of personal responsibility. I'm gonna, I wasn't going to use this as an example, if it's okay, because, right, you know, good people, wonderful people. Uh, one time we had a big tiff in the car, in the front seat of the car, in the middle of all the mayhem. My father issued, uttered a few uh, F words. And he said to me, in this dust settled, he said, I never thought you were going to make me say that. And of course, I had never said it myself. He just added to my own repertoire, while also blaming, making me take responsibility for something which indeed, in fact, he had said. There was a problem. There was a missing piece of the development of a sense of personal responsibility. And I do think, you know, I think that the, the church, you know, the glories of the church and those who did perform its glories of service on one end of the spectrum. On the other, I think people were attracted to this moral order, maybe in fact because they suffered from issues which they thought would be we consoled or negated or neutralized or uh, buried uh, in the moral order of the church's machinery. Um, a wonderful guy named Will Spade, he was the head of the Philadelphia investigation, the, the grand jury that they did two reporters down there on sex abuse. As long as he could take it before he went into private practice, he said, investigating sex abuse in the Philadelphia Archdiocese was like going to work in a factory every day and the product was damaged human beings. And you know, that's something we've all, you know, you don't need, you're in Boston, we don't need to hear any more about that. But it's certainly, it's, it's certainly colored my, my mm -hmm. reflections. 
My father, of course, is very different from these perks. For one thing, he briefly and genuinely apologized to me in the winter of 1977. We both sat looking out over these railroad tracks somewhere on the west coast of Florida. We'd gone to pick up his father's butterscotch, 67 Caprice. As the queen to me, I drove it back to Jersey, leaked oil the whole way, and I barely made it home. My grandfather died in that car. My father apologized briefly. I remained silent, uh, not because I was speechless, because I do have this kind of emotional lag on issues like that. This one haunted me for decades, almost a world record lag. Mm -hmm. My father was a very honest man, especially presented with options, giving a very short answer to a simple question. As in the post-Boston Globe moment, I said to him, what if something had happened to me, you know, in those days, and somebody had done something to me, would you believe, who would you believe, me or them? He gave an honest answer, the one I, I guess I expected. But then later, in a very rare, unguarded moment, in response to the crisis, he remarked that in his day at St. Peter's Prep in the 1940s, the fellas, and he never referred to himself, he almost never used his own agency as a person, he always referred to via others. The fellas, by which he meant to include himself, the fellas knew enough to avoid the funny ones among the nearly all Jesuit faculty, priests, and scholastics at the prep. Now that was very striking to me. You're not normal, you get in trouble. Now, of course, it's a faulty argument empirically. Look at somebody like Joe Califano, even though he's a Democrat, my father would disdain that. He, of course, was reported in his memoir having been sexually abused at a, at a retreat center in Staten Island exactly the same time, a student of the Jesuits broke the prep. What my father is doing is, he was scuttling his most cherished historical narrative, which held that prior to, say, 1967, nobody in that world sinned grievously at all, much less committed sexual sin. By further distancing himself from cognitive difference, and that from difference of all kinds, he was indicating somehow to me that he, in fact, encountered something like that before I came along. In other words, I was always fascinated to understand the source of it. I was always fed. It couldn't have started with me in 1956. He was, you know, in his late 20s. Something was going on in this man's life. And I'm not saying it was sexual abuse. It was just an experience of some kind of various kinds of difference that he could not abide. And he was acknowledging that for the first time. His golden age, the pre-1967 golden age, was like the Catholic world was quite a bit more complicated. That admission cracked open the final frontier. I insisted that invoking the specter of not just of sort of being, but of violence, of family violence, explicitly in the conversation. I wanted just to reveal the source. Where did this come from? It couldn't have just started with me. I put him in an impossible position. He said, yeah, OK, I was violent. And he said, it didn't mean anything. It didn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. Now, we were both surprised, I think, rather than my customary petulant response, I'm a professor. <laughs> I'm a professor. It sure as hell means a lot to me. Instead, we agreed. To, I left it an open question. Because I was thinking by then about my own son's struggles. What would Charlie struggle with the same force as me? What would it mean? We collaborated with him on a far more negotiable moral order than I knew as a child. It's more arduous, though, in its execution. It's more physically demanding for the three of us, more prone to misreadings, emotional lags, to say nothing of emotional jags, precisely because it is so doggedly collaborative. It's the work of a lifetime. It's totally consuming, exhausting. For respite, regularly finds me with my head buried in the IKEA sofa. My wife never buries her head in the sofa. She does take naps when I drive her. With Charlie, uh, it's kind of can be an exhausting life. I fall short virtually every day in my life trying to uh, honor Charlie's experience in autism. But as Christina patiently reminds me, this is why they call it a relationship, which, in her view, is something that is somewhat new in my experience. One in which love, in fact, does bear all things. I've written virtually nothing of my 13-year duration in autism land, really even until now, into this talk. But I do think a written narrative, like a prayer, changes things although not in our control exactly how. I sent my father an essay on some matters treated here in tonight. It was going to be published in the volume I edited on American Catholic Studies. He told me he couldn't open it. I said, all right, I'm pulling it from the volume. I wasn't going to bring my hard copy to have him say I lost it or whatever. But he did say, this is remarkable, he said, you know, down the road. You know, down the road, he probably use this material. And of course, he was justly confident. He fulfilled all the obligations of his church. He'd done everything they'd asked and expected. He should be okay. He deserves to have those promises fulfilled. We've come far enough down the road to acknowledge, in fact, his faith tradition, the one that troubled me so. Alongside the mayhem, it fostered in me a genuinely communitarian ethos, one that we ardently pray serves persons with autism, including the nearly millionth human beings will age out of school programs over the next 15 years and we need to be housed and cared for. Major national public vision. I further affirm 
the irreducible, irreducible core of my own faith is the conviction of the reality of the mystical body of Christ. Its presence animating the communitarian ecos, which I never fulfilled in organized religion, but I become more intent every moment of my life to somehow shepherd Charlie into this beloved community that will abide, honors human dignity and beauty. The mystical body, it may still be coterminous with the church, it may be deinstitutionalized, which is an image I like given the history of that term in mental illness circles. I can, I can hardly work either way, that front or church. Folks here tonight, I think, are much further down the road of that vocation of service and needs. It's the great frontier that we're all facing for these individuals who will need care for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've witnessed just how ubiquitous the mystical body really is. Three years ago, we absolutely bottomed out with Charlie's placement. He'd been thrown out of several autism self-contained autism classrooms, which are sort of the core, <coughs> kind of like the low-bottom autism classroom because there's no hope of so-called mainstreaming or, or integration or whatever you want to call it. And he's being expelled from another school district autism self-contained program, um, which we thought was designed for someone with autism like him. And so um, uh, we had to respond in person to the, in front of a large number of officials of this school administration. And this issue about personal responsibility, I'm not, I'm not uh, absolving myself. I've always had a problem with reading things like incident reports. They say every time Charlie cracks his head in school, there's always detailed reports. I don't want to like part of it. My wife always reads in very, very, very detailed fashion. I've gotten better recently. But my thing was always, I'll come into the meeting, and I'm telling you, rhetorically, you know, they met their match. You know, and so I would come out strong with me of social justice, and morality, all these kind of things. Well, this day, Christine always looked laid back. On this day, I kept quiet. And I heard my wife get into this remarkably uh, fervent kind of moral discourse of Charlie's rights as a human being. And then I heard her say to these public school administrators, that which you do to the least of these, so you've done unto me. Mm -hmm. I was like, wait a minute, I've heard that before. <laughs> I know that line. And I said, wait a minute, it can't be religious. So my wife I said, wait a minute, it's Carl Walden, my favorite movie on the waterfront. It's probably Pete Barry's famous soliloquy. And of course, that's where Christina got it. I understand it also goes back to this gospel, St. Matthew. It has ancient Christian uh, connections. Um, Powerful. This mystical body of Christ, powerful, powerful kind of metaphor for interfaith advocacy. We're all joined together, despite enormous obstacles to kind of experience visible communion. Because people in autism land, it's very difficult to get together. Uh, the mystical body of Christ, my understanding, is what links us all together. Finally, when Charlie went missing a year ago, uh, he bolted from, he has quarter milers speed. He was with my wife, and he was embroiled, you know, he was witnessing a, a disorderly situation he didn't take a liking to. She turned her back, and the next thing you know, he was gone. She sent me a text. She said, he's gone. I said, gone? Well, I understood what she meant. I was 13 miles away. I tried to visualize the wide terrain where I knew exactly where it was at South Plainfield. I tried to feel where his heartbeat was. And then I heard this prayer coming out. It was sort of kind of semi-voluntary, semi-out of somewhere. Angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love and trust me near, ever this day be at Charlie's side to light and guard, to rule and guide. Amen. Well, that angel appeared. Half an hour later, a special education teacher was riding up in 287. Charlie decided to get himself home by running on the interstate highway. And he got to uh, at least another exit away. And then this special education teacher said to her sister, that boy is autistic, I have no doubt. She pulled over, got him to enter in the car, asked for the cell phone number. And this is totally classic, Charlie. He, he was intelligible to the last digit. So, in effect, they only had 10 options. They could have tried all 10 options because you couldn't hear the seven at the last digit. But thanks to this guardian angel, and Christina and the cops were nearby, thanks to this guardian angel, we're still together. We call ourselves a tight team of three, a monastery on wheels, persisting in living in the world as it is and as we are. Amen. And thanks. And thanks for having me. So, Think about it. 
In the 40s, 50s, and 60s, there were no educational rights. You couldn't, you had no right to insist that a disabled child could attend school of any kind. You had no, there were no human rights. There's, in many countries, there's still hard fact none. And so in a way, in this 1990, you know, the, D, the, the Disability Act, um, it's, a, it's a really a quite an amazing story. And it's not, it's not very long ago at all. There were no human rights for the disabled. And it still is the last frontier, let's say. I mean, in many ways, it still does seem. I mean, you know, because you see the, 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 you know, the sort of the customary kind of discrimination and um, disdain, I guess. So, okay. And then there are other people, many people are very loving and understand. But, but you yeah. know how those rights came into being? Yeah. It was a group of adoptive mm -hmm. parents started working at Fernald. Right. They mm -hmm. saw kids that they thought were normal if they lived, you know, right. they might have, mm -hmm. you know. Right. So, and they, they basically insisted that these kids come out of Fernald and they would right. adopt them. See, this is one of the great That's stories. How, yeah, exactly. It's an amazing right. story. That it is. It's, it's one of the great stories. One of the ironies of that is, for, see, uh, there, was a, there was a parental re resistance to this bogus kind of medical and scientific authority basically beginning in the 60s, 70s, and it achieved all these tremendous goals, and it really is a great story. The only strange footnote downside to that, the parent movement became so um, persuasive and so morally just that when we got this whole vaccination thing, basically the whole, which has really cost us eight or 10 years of research mm -hmm. on autism, the whole vaccination thing was a parent movement, a parent resistance to the medical authorities. And of course, it proved to be a terrible kind of like, um, what do you call it, you know, a sideshow. But, but that's not here or there. The fact is, it was, it was, it's been parents really since the 60s. Parents have fought for the redefinition of these things for scientific research. And so it is, it is a great story. And um, it's, you know, I've thought about that sometimes. Like, what would it be like to have a child that has this totally rare and unheard of and unprecedented condition and you were totally isolated and alone? I mean, when Charlie, when Charlie was diagnosed in 1997, I went to the books, the library in St. Paul where we were living, and the books still had mostly titles like Autism, Nightmare Without End, and some of these diversion narratives I'm talking about too, but it wasn't very hopeful. And then they began talking about this whole phenomenon of the growth, the epidemic, whatever it meant. But in a way, I think this autism thing, it's, it's such a misleading term. It just refers to me and any kind of disability which um, which hinders, you know, or, or you know, which limits the child in any way. And, and I think that um, there's always a tremendous solidarity across kind of like definitions, across boundaries of conditions. Um, people like my wife flourish so well with the internet. I mean, because you can't really get out, you know, and see people. I, I really have it. I mean, I've not done well. This is the first time I've talked about any of this stuff, and it's really it's the first time I've tried to write about it. And I'm trying to do this book if I can. I mean, it's going to be kind of fits and starts. But thanks so much, yeah, that's true. That's a wonderful observation. And that's, again, almost a lost <coughs> story of the families going back to the 40s, 50s, mm -hmm. 60s, where there was just no, there were no services, there was no, you know. She kept her home for 35 years. I didn't see a lot of that, oh, yeah. yeah. See that? Just died recently. Yeah, oh, I see. Oh, wow. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, yes. Um, yeah, I was wondering about the Fernal Medical Center. Yeah. Um, it was like a Families. And every generation and every one of my sisters has some, has a child with PDD. Mm -hmm. um, not, you know, high functioning, right. various, right, right. Things, including, and then I'm first cousin level. I, I guess my question is this. I mean, I, I'm i thinking of like trying to draw a genogram here in my yes. thing. Has there been very many, and my, one of my sisters, uh, whose son is um, 16, mm -hmm. um, and it's the, uh, I forget the actual, Diagnosis I means mm -hmm. high functioning, right. the old, mm -hmm. what they call Asperger's, but right. it's not that, it's right. more, mm -hmm. no social cues. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Which is always an irreducible core of the autism. Right. right. And he, anyway, uh, she, but they did very early intervention and she, right. they did everything in the world. So, of course, she wants to write a book mm -hmm. for other people that <laughs> right. she's met, you know, right, right. just to share mm -hmm. the story kind of thing. Right. But I guess my question is this Has there been much done in terms of any kind of genetic, the genetic stuff of it? I mean, I know, I mean, my mother also, had, my mother had triplets when mm -hmm. she was uh, 39, mm -hmm. all right? When she had a one-year-old and she had another one after that. Mm -hmm. She's now a, a, a radical feminist Catholic. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, That's it's interesting. She, no, she got degrees in theology and taught the marriage course mm -hmm. in the Catholic high school. So oh, okay. she, she proselytized. Mm -hmm. But, um, mm -hmm. That's true. The uh, question, uh, so anyway, these two of these, the two boys, mm -hmm. there was a diagnosis of them, because right. they're autistic, because they right. weren't, you know, relational, and right. 
throwing circles on the albums yes. and all these things. Mm -hmm. But it turned out okay, I mean, that wasn't any diagnosis. Mm -hmm. but, I, but anyway, this fascination for me is like, is clearly, uh -huh. I, I'm a Catholic nun, I have no kids. Uh -huh. <laughs> so uh, I'd love to see some sort of, you know, family genetic kind of Yeah, I mean, the last, yeah, 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 the last, the big focus of research, again, I have to struggle through the politics, but the genetic research is the main frontier now. I mean, there's no question, it's a genetic condition. People say that what makes it more prevalent if it's, a, if it's a genetic condition, it's clearly understood by people in science as a genetic, it has a genetic component always. I mean, it really does. It has a genetic component, which is really a very central element of it. But, you know, there does seem to be the possibility now, you know, people suggest that what if there's some kind of toxic environmental, any number of other things that might trigger it. You know, I, I just don't know. My view, I mean, it's totally unofficial view, it's all unscientific. I actually agree with the great Temple Grandin, who's one of the, probably the most famous watchers of person on the planet. I and mean, she makes the point that, uh, it could very well be part of human evolution, you know, an element of human evolution, a little nick in the DNA. And that's what makes the ADHD thing so interesting. Because yeah. ADHD kind of like ushered in the autism generation because the ADHD thing was like 20, 25 years in advance of the autism diagnosis. They're very similar in many respects, uh, genetically, at least in terms of the way some of the manifestations of it. And so um, there's been like a nick in the DNA, you know, I think. On the other hand, you know, people will say, and this is where the big issue now is, they're decommissioning people who have such a mild form of autism that they're basically not considered to be in the same part of the spectrum. The same spectrum as, say, someone like my son. And that makes sense to me in many ways because, uh, like I was talking to Carlo earlier, you might have seen it was a piece in the New York Times, an op-ed by a guy, a writer, who said, I, was, I had Asperger's for a few days, for a while, and his mother made a documentary about him. She was an Asperger's researcher. She basically chose her own son. He seemed to be, but then he said, I moved to New York City, I met all these people just like me, and I'm really fine. <laughs> and so, um, it's all, you know what I mean? So, so there's that end of the spectrum, which is so mild, and, there, and I think it makes sense to reclaim. Because see, the one thing I don't get into at all, is there's this whole kind of movement they call neurodiversity. There's all these bloggers and advocates, or, they, they're much more like me than like my son. I mean, I'm not saying they're not autistic, it's just that there, there's a major, major range on that spectrum. And I think that a lot of the increase has to do with that, that diagnosis. But, but I also do believe there's some kind of, gen I think there's just some kind of genetic evolutionary phenomena that is, because you know, as you know, it's not just autism, maybe Tourette syndrome. I don't know if you look at the, dis you have the disability services here, I'm sure, you look at the range of things that students are diagnosed with that never were really heard yeah, of. This is that. an interesting thing. In my family, we have a lot of things on the spectrum, yeah. not just the S, right. the Tourette's, a severely autism. Neurological mm -hmm. issues, Neurological yeah. Neurological things. And like my first cousin, my cousin fought, had a whole like a parade in her hometown to get my, um, what is it, it's not my nephew, but she's my first yeah. cousin, whatever he is, <laughs> like, first cousin was removed uh, in mainstream. Yeah. It's a school. The kids, the kids in community college. Right it's now. genetic. My family is all, is all neurological disorders, MS yeah. and autism, ADHD, mental. It's all, my family, they do great with other conditions, but, they're, but they, it's all neurological, and you know, it runs in the family. They really, yeah.